Today I want to talk about the chemistry of methyl iodide, the thermal chemistry of nickel 101. This work was done by one of my PhD students, Arwan Yandra, and it was funded mostly by the National Science Foundation in the United States. So let me start by putting this work in context. Uh, in our laboratory over uh, the last few years, we've been interested in, in looking at the details of the chemistry of hydrocarbons on surfaces, and in particular, of alkyl groups. Now, putting alkyl groups under uh, ultra high vacuum conditions, which is uh, uh, what we use because we use uh, uh, surface sensitive techniques that need electrons, and also we work with clean surfaces. To do that uh, is rather difficult because activating alkanes is quite uh, uh, an, an inefficient process. So we have looked, we and other groups, of course, uh, we just heard earlier on from uh, Professor Sholimoshi's uh, group as well. We, we have looked, attempted to make these alkyl groups in different ways. And the way we have approached this is by borrowing an idea from gas chemistry, gas phase chemistry, in which you take a compound, what we call a precursor, which is ideal because it can form the radical that you're interested in, given that you can break a bond, uh, a given bond is. So to give you an example, alkyl halides belong to this family. If you take a methyl iodide in this particular case, but it actually applies to any other alkyl uh, halide, if you take methyl iodide, the carbon iodine bond is only 56 kilocalories per mole. So in gas phase, you can actually activate that bond either thermally or photolytically, and then actually, for, or even with electron bombardment, and then form methyl radicals. And uh, using that idea, we thought, well, maybe we can do the same on the surface. And in fact, uh, the work over the last few years has shown that this, in, in many cases, happens to be the case. Uh, we, in our laboratory, work quite extensively on platinum, and uh, now are extending our work to nickel and copper. I'm going to be talking about the nickel work right now. Other people have worked on uh, palladium, rhodium, silver, and so on. And by and large, this approach has actually worked out. Uh, there is another uh, word of caution that uh, have to be given here, and that is the fact that if we do this on surfaces, if you take methyl iodide on the surface and decompose it, uh, and if, if it works, which is something that we had to prove, but that by now we are confident in most cases do could work, you still form methyl groups, but you also form iodine. So that's another point that you have to take into consideration. When you choose one of these precursors, you have to make sure that the coaxial atom, if any, uh, is an atom that basically doesn't affect the chemistry. And we have work reasonably hard at convincing ourselves that the iodine atoms do block some size, but really doesn't change the chemistry itself. And uh, that's a long debate still in the literature, and I would be happy to talk to you about it uh, later on. But actually, I'm covering my back, because I know that's a question that would come uh, if I don't mention it. But anyway, we are also looking for other ways of making this method look without the iodine. For now, we do have to live with the iodine on the surface. We do believe that the iodine is not really uh, changing the chemistry so much. So having given you that as an introduction, let me start with a particular system that I want to talk about today, and that is methyl iodide on nickel 100. And um, I will show to you some evidence about the dissociation of the carbon iodine bond, and we also uh, measure the kinetics of that reaction, and some preliminary evidence that we actually form methyl groups on the surface, which is what we're looking for. And after doing that, then I'll show you some of the thermal chemistry of that, uh, those methyl groups on the surface, with and without coabsorption of hydrogen. And then I'll move on into some uh, interesting reactions that we get to see on nickel, which actually brings uh, a little bit of a, uh, it, it tells us that we have to be a little bit careful with this approach. And that is, under certain conditions, which, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, namely high coverages of hydrogen, we find that the methyl iodide itself actually can react with the hydrogen before dissociating, before breaking the carbon iodine bond and making methyl groups. And then you are actually having a reaction, a competing reaction, where methyl iodide reacts with hydrogen for methane as well. I'll show you some of that, and then, uh, time provided, I'll, I'll talk about some other acyl iodides and, and give you the conclusions. Right, let me begin by telling you about the carbon iodine bond breaking reaction. 
Uh, one way we look at this is by using XPS. We look at the iodine XPS signal, uh, and what we have here is we have absorbed a certain amount of uh, uh, methyl iodide, in this case, uh, deuterated methyl iodide, and three angles corresponds to about saturation coverage, which is about 20% of uh, methyl iodide molecules as compared to the number of nickel atoms. And so we look at the iodine XPS signal as a function of a needing temperature. And we are using the fact that that iodine XPS signal is sensitive to the chemical environment and therefore shifts as the carbon iodine bond breaks. We also have seen this in other surfaces. It works on nickel as well. So when you start at low temperatures, around 92 degrees Kelvin or so, as low as we can put this methyl iodide on, on the surface, we get an iodine peak at a position that is characteristic of gas molecular methyl iodide. But as you heat up the surface, you see a, a shift of about 0.4 dB in that peak, and we identify that shift with uh, the breaking of the carbon iodine bond because this binding entity is corresponding to atomic iodine on the surface. We actually calibrate that by putting iodine by itself on the surface. And we see that that reaction actually takes place. The carbon iodine bond breaking takes place somewhere between, if we actually follow here, the position of the peak versus temperature, you see there is a wide range of temperatures in which that peak shifts, indicating that the reaction takes place over a wide range of, of temperatures. It starts at about 120 Kelvin or so, and it's over by about 150 Kelvin. But it does take quite a wide range of temperature. It's a, it's a reaction that has a very low activation rate. In fact, we decided to measure the kinetics a little bit more carefully. The way we've done that, uh, here I have summarized the previous slide, basically the two meaningful spectra. This is the iodine now blown up, the 3B, 5B, 5, uh, 5 half XPS signal for the molecular uh, species and after dissociation with the uh, shifting peak. And what we decided to do is do isothermal experiments in which we tune our spectrometer to a given energy, in this case 620.2 dB, and then follow the, the signal decay as a function of uh, time for a given temperature. And what we get is a rather noisy uh, set of curves, but enough to calculate uh, a, a reaction rate. This is what you get uh, as you heat to the indicated temperatures at 100 Kelvin. You basically get no dissociation, but uh, you increase the temperature, the dissociation takes place faster and faster. And the kinetics is rather complicated. You'll see uh, what I mean a little bit later on in the talk. But if we assume first order kinetics and use the initial decay here of uh, this curve, we can estimate an apparent activation energy that is rather low. It's about 3.5 kilocalories per mole. And to calibrate you, uh, if you look at Grignard reagents, actually that's the kind of activation energies that uh, you see on solution as well. So we do break the bond, the carbon iodine bond, except uh, relatively low activation energy process and it takes place below 160 degrees Kelvin. What we really want is to form methyl groups. And we have some tentative uh, identification of these methyl groups by both XPS and static secondary ion mass spectrometry. Uh, the XPS, again, this is taking carbon 1S XPS as a function of an even temperature as you see here, and it's rather noisy so it's not that convincing. But what you see is a peak at a position that corresponds to methyl iodide, molecular methyl iodide at low temperatures, and then it gets quite broadened and uh, shifts a little bit uh, to lower binding energies, and the peak is around where you expect methyl groups to be, even though it's a rather broad, broad peak and it's not uh, that conclusive. Also, if we look at a static uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry, this is a clean surface, and then when you put methyl iodide and you start heating up, uh, you get to see new peaks corresponding to the methyl groups, either by themselves or with a nickel ion. And you see that signal actually goes out down with temperature because of the formation of methane, which I'll show you in a second. So these two pieces of evidence, uh, together with some other arguments that I'm going to give you later on, and the fact that we have seen methyl groups on other surfaces by, for instance, reflection absorption in infrared spectroscopy, uh, make us quite confident uh, that we actually make methyl groups. I also will try to point out a little bit later on that we only form methyl groups below 200 degrees Kelvin. We do not see any more dehydrogenated species. We don't see CH2, we don't see CH groups, just CH3. Well, let me show you a little bit about the thermal chemistry. 
This is the thermal problem dissolution of methyl iodide, and this is done at slightly above uh, a monolayer, so you don't get a little bit of condensed methyl iodide, which is what you see here coming off. But then the two main products observed are methane and hydrogen. Uh, I should point out, in this particular surface, we see no other products coming up, no other gas products. We do not see any coupling products in here, and we look for them. Uh, so you get many information in a rather complicated peak, and you get hydrogen uh, dissolution as well uh, in more than one peak, which implies that whatever fragments stay on the surface dehydrogenate in a stepwise fashion. So we look more carefully at that. Um, we can look at the thermal desorption of each one of the three species, the molecular desorption, the hydrogen, and the methane desorption as a function of exposure. And again, I remind you about three languages in each one of these corresponds to saturation. So the one thing you see is that below one monolayer, well, I should be saying one monolayer, but saturation, which is about 20% of the monolayer, you get no molecular desorption whatsoever, and all you get is basically condensation afterwards and desorption. And so the two products that you do see are hydrogen and F, uh, methane. Methane actually forms in a rather complicated uh, set of processes because these peaks actually change shape, uh, as you can see, as you go to higher temperature, it acquires this uh, low temperature tail. I'll actually focus on this a little bit uh, more in the next few slides. Uh, and then hydrogen, at the beginning, at low coverages, you basically get one peak for hydrogen, which is the peak that you get when hydrogen recombines the surface. And what that tells us is that at low coverages, you just get dehydrogenation very fast on the surface, and then later on, hydrogen just goes up. But as you increase the coverage, then you inhibit some of this dehydrogenation. It takes place at higher temperatures, and on top of that, the efficiency is not as high because you start forming methane, and it happens in more than one step. Here we have the yields, and basically it illustrates one of the things I was saying. At low temperatures, you get a lot of hydrogen and almost no methane. But then at a, about half saturation, you get a, it's a threshold coverage where you get a lot of methane and less hydrogen from the composition. So you have actually switched between having mostly dehydrogenation to having mostly hydrogenation. There is still the question about the hydrogenation of methane, how it takes place, and that's what I want to address next. All right, so here it is. Uh, more TPD thermal program desorption. Uh, this is rather busy and I'm not going to address all of the things in this spectrum, but let me uh, try to walk you through the slide. On the left hand side, we have the methane uh, desorption from methyl iodide, except that now we have decided to use CD3I instead of CH3I in order to keep track of the hydrogen, what happens to the hydrogen. And this is what you get. You absorb it at below 100 degrees Kelvin, but we have annealed the surface to 100 degrees Kelvin, and then we do our thermal desorption. You only get CD4 and CD3I. This, this slide is uh, presented in a funny way because it's meant to uh, present another argument as well, which I'll get in a minute. But nevertheless, this is what you have to look at right now. This is the desorption of CD3IH, and this is the desorption of uh, CD4 you get no other products coming on. Now, you do get CD3H because unfortunately, uh, there is always hydrogen background, uh, in the background in any ultra high vacuum chamber, and we co co absorb not large amounts of hydrogen, but enough to actually hydrogenate the methyl groups. And you start with CD3 groups, which we know we can form at very low temperatures, and then hydrogen incorporates, and you form CD3H. If you require the hydrogen to come from the composition of the CD3 group, which is what you need to form CD4, then you can see that the desorption takes a much higher temperature, or I should say somewhat higher temperature. Instead of 220 degrees Kelvin, you do it at 250 degrees Kelvin. The difference here is that here the hydrogen is available atomically on the surface. In this case, you have to decompose your methyl groups to form CH2s, or CD2s, I should say, and then the deuterium that comes from that reaction is the one that is picked up by some of the other methyl groups and that's how you form CD4. And so what this indicates is that the CD3 do, does not decompose <coughs> below about 200 degrees Kelvin. Anything that you see below that is actually incorporation of atomic hydrogen from the surface. That's what is shown here, and let's ignore these other two traces for now. Now, we wanted to explore uh, this hydrogenation reaction a little bit more in detail, and for that we actually did a co-absorption experiment. 
in which we put the methyl groups, and now before that we put the hydrogen on the surface. Instead of relying on having background hydrogen, we go and put hydrogen on surface, we calculate on surface with hydrogen, and then put the CP3 that in order to enhance this reaction. And sure enough, you kill the, the pathway where CD4 is formed, no decomposition takes place, you can hydrogenate all the methyl groups before you get to this temperature, except for this little bond which you, we associate with the detail in the preprint. So you do form CD3H exclusively. By the way, no exchange, no hydrogen dendritum exchange is observed on this surface as, as well. So you see nothing else but CD3H in this state. And if we look at the top, top curve, it basically has two components. The component that is not shaded is the same component that we see here, which is CD3H on the surface plus the hydrogen, atomic hydrogen on the surface, recombine what is called a reductive elimination step and form the CD3H, the same as we saw here. But then we found an interesting result on top of that, which is uh, we have a, a peak, the red peak, that grows at very low temperatures. And if you see this temperature, uh, in fact, if you see the leading edge of this peak, you realize that methane in this case, in the presence of excess of hydrogen, actually takes place at very low temperatures, temperatures below those where we know that the carbon iodine bond breaks. So this actually indicates that something else is taking place. And in fact, what we've done here, which I'm going to correlate to something else in the next slide, is we have put the hydrogen plus the uh, CD3I anneal to given temperatures and then do the CPD afterwards. And you realize that if you anneal to about 150 degrees Kelvin, then you are done with this first uh, mechanism here, the one where uh, methane forms a very low temperature, and all you are left with is the standard reductive elimination step. But at low temperatures, you actually get this extra feature here. And that's what I'm going to discuss next. We went back and explored the kinetics of the carbon iron bond breaking now under these circumstances. These circumstances are we pre-absorb hydrogen, as opposed to what I showed you before, which was just the methyl iodide by itself. Here we do the same experiment I showed you in the TPD. I showed you with the kinetic XPS experiment. We put hydrogen first, we put the CD3I later, and now we follow the iodine signal as a function of time to see what happens. And this is what you have. This is the initial stage, and then this is the final stage. We are to high temperatures to know uh, what the level of the signal when dissociation is complete. And what you see is actually that at, at intermediate temperatures, you see a rapid decrease of the signal followed by a slower decrease of the signal. And this rapid decrease of the signal correlates quite well with the amount of methyl iodide, uh, methane that we make at low temperatures. That's what is shown here. The amount of XPS loss suddenly down here versus the area TPD. And so you get to see that there are two steps here. One very fast in which the carbon iodine bond breaks at the same time as, the, uh, as when you form methane, and then the regular step where methyl iodide dissociates slowly, but then methane uh, forms from methyl groups and not from methyl iodide. So this first step is a new step which we think involves methyl iodide by itself uh, without dissociation. And we propose some SN2 mechanisms. These are summarized the evidence, pieces of evidence that we uh, have for it. This pathway only takes place in the presence of coaxial hydrogen. And it takes place at very low temperatures, below the temperatures needed to break the carbon iodine bond by itself. And we know by this kinetic experiment that the carbon iodine bond uh, fission is the limiting step. So we put all that together and we come up with a model in which the reaction takes place all in a concerted step. Methyl iodide starts to up on the surface, and as the iodine leaves, the hydrogen comes in and forms methane. And since I see the chairman standing up, I think I'm going to stop here. And, uh, Thank you for your attention. Yes, please. Francisco, I'm trying to do the work of Professor Ryan and his course. They have investigated methyl iodide absorption of the union and plasma as far as I remember. They have proposed the now the dissociation of methyl iodide, dehydrogenation of methyl groups, Disproportionation of the CH group finally forming an epididium like surface species, and the methane formation was interpreted as a result of a surface process. Could you comment on that in your case? Um, 
I'm not sure what, maybe uh, clarify what the difference here. You do form methyl groups on the surface, you dehydrogenate some of them to provide hydrogen, and then hydrogenate some of the methyl groups to form methyl. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the steps. But what I'm saying is that you do need to dehydrogenate the, the methyl groups and have the hydrogen going to the surface. <coughs> And so you can do that by, by decomposing the methyl groups, which take a certain temperature. In the case of nickel, about 200 degrees Kelvin. On platinum, we've seen the same. But if you provide the hydrogen beforehand, then you can actually shift that. The, what I'm trying to say, the limiting step for that reaction is the decomposition of the methyl groups. If you provide the hydrogen beforehand, then the reaction can take place at much lower temperatures. You, you have the hydrogen already there. The limiting step then is the recombination, which takes place 50 to 100 uh, degrees lower temperature. So, this uh, low temperature of methane formation you find from uh, the metal and the hydrogen doesn't relate to excitation and the pH formula. Do you know anything uh, about the rate? Uh, the genetics are very tricky because uh, okay. if you notice, know, it's faster than the time scale that we can measure. Yes. And we believe it's entirely different mechanism. So I couldn't tell, I mean, it's not a comparison between with, with and without the hydrogen or the high temperature peak and the low temperature peak because I think it's a different pathway. In this case, we think that it's a concerted mechanism. The high temperature peak, you break the carbon hydrogen bond first on methyl groups and then the methyl groups incorporate hydrogen. So I'm not sure I could compare it. Uh, Do you have any information about the <coughs> structure or configuration of our soil? Measurable. How it absorbs, you mean? Measurable like from nickel We don't have direct evidence, but uh, some detailed XPS analysis of the XPS seem to imply that this iodine down methyl groups up. We have seen that on other surfaces, so we, we think that on nickel should be about the same. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the uh, iodine inclines to the surface? Um, I'll tell you about that. On nickel, I wouldn't know, but uh, on platinum, we've done uh, infrared uh, reflection experiments that show that below half saturation, the methyl iodide is completely tilted, and as you pack the surface, they actually all tilt in, in groups, they all tilt up entirely vertical. We use the selection rule of IR, and it shows clearly that as you hit half saturation, there is a transition, a, a, a concerted transition in standing up. This could be the same on copper as well, so I think that this could happen on nickel as well. Another question? Would you like to? Personally, I would. Yes, exactly. Mr. Dowd, thank you very much.